So to start off, um, just to set the scene a little bit, when we're talking about orchards, Philadelphia Orchard Projects, we really view things as food forests, which one definition of this is this picture, there's seven layers of every forest. So it's not just fruit crop trees, uh, your apples, it's a, a, a diversity of things. Um, you have an understory of medicinal herbs, and maybe you have a shrub layer of berries, and then you have some root crops pulling up those nutrients from below. Um, but a lot of these that grow well in our climate are more uncommon to us. They're not being sold in our grocery stores. We don't know how to cook them. And so a lot of what we want to do is education. Um, not only on how to grow these plants, uh, how to harvest them, but how to eat them as food and use them as medicine um, and use them in ceremony. And so we have a couple of different things we do. One is uh, called pop harvest, where it's kind of like a flash mob harvest on a, a public access site so that we have a lot of underutilized abundance, we like to call it. There's uh, edible fruit trees that are just on this on the sidewalk throughout the city. Lots of June berries, mulberries, crab apples. Um, and so we come together with a group of volunteers, harvest it all. Um, sometimes a portion of it will go to an ice cream shop and they'll make a special ice cream sandwich and some of the proceeds go to pop or we donate it somewhere and everybody takes some home and shares kind of the joy of like abundance with our neighbors and with our families and then we also uh have what we call popcorn or pop harvest ed um and so some of the workshops we have are listed here using trifoliate oranges which we're going to talk about later but the furthest northern growing citrus we have uh making fire cider medicine out of that processing the ginkgo nuts that none of you have tried yet and they taste so good um so lots of different classes, and we're always looking for more community educators to join the conversation in this. So if you or someone you know uh, want to share cultural, culinary, or medicinal uses of these lesser known fruits and herbs, uh, we are looking for both experienced and newer uh, to teaching folks. We offer an honorarium and serve safe certification, um, and you can get all details about this, and there's a form to uh, submit a proposal for a workshop um, right here, it's listed phillyorchards.org slash pop harvest, or you can get in touch with me directly. Um, and you'll find my Corey at phillyorchards.org is my email address. And we really want to support your learning and your journey in this way. And so there's a couple of ways to be involved with us more. One is we have a mailing list um, that will tell you about these harv harvest events and workshops that we're putting on. We also have a pretty active blog. So we'll tell you like, oh, we just put out this new thing about how to manage fire blight. And we're making more and more video resources. Um, we have different hands out and resources like there's a picture here of a uh, immune boosting elderberry syrup recipe with pictures, easy to walk through, uh, maybe an activity if you work with kids. Uh, we're also pretty active on Instagram at Philly Orchards and recommend some of our partner organizations. If you want to get really steeped in this world, uh, we would recommend Albury Wild Wisdom, Wild Foodies Meetup, and Philly Herb Hub. And now I'm going to pass it to Phil. Thanks, Corey. So I'm going to introduce uh, gleaning and foraging and talk about um, ethics and safety for these things. Uh, and just to define those terms, if they're not familiar. So uh, gleaning is is when we pick uh, food that would otherwise go to waste from a farm field or an orchard. Uh, either it's a crop that, um, for whatever reason, the farmer grower is not going to pick all of it, uh, whether it's like end of the season when there's just a few left or um, for whatever reason, they're, they're not harvesting at all. And so we go in and pick that. Sometimes gleaning is also done more intentionally where a, a, a grower will plant a row of something with an in, intent purpose for donation. Um, whereas foraging is, is the picking of uh, plants from often wild spaces or public lands uh, for use. Um, either edible, medicinal, et cetera. But so one is from a, a managed cultivated space gleaning and the other is from a more wild space foraging. Um, do like to highlight 
at this point that pop orchards are not spaces generally intended for foraging. These are uh, 66 orchard sites across the city that are cared for, maintained uh, by partner community groups. And they're the ones that determine what to do with the produce. They're not intended for anyone from anywhere in and around the city to go and pick, with not, especially with, without direct permission from the partner site. Um, next slide. So just to follow up with a, a disclaimer, um, you know, we stress that you shouldn't consume any parts of wild edible plants, herbs, weeds, trees, or bushes, unless you've verified with your health professional that it's safe for you. Um, and if you are trying new foods, it's best to introduce them slowly into your diet in small amounts until you're sure they agree with you. Uh, and all the information we're presenting today is for in informational educational purposes not a substitute for a diagnosis or treatment by a healthcare professional. Um, so again, harvest use at, at your own risk. And uh, we'll talk a little more about specific ethics we should keep in mind. So this is very important. Um, we're, we're cultivating a relationship relationship with the environment when we're doing these activities. And we need to keep ethics in mind to ensure that there will be harvests for others and for future generations. Uh, so we want to tread lightly, be a good steward to the land, uh, take only what you need and use all that you take and share any excess. And be careful not to damage plants. So you need to really understand the plants you're, you're harvesting from to make sure you're, you're not hurting them or endangering future harvests. Uh, don't harvest from communities that, that are not your own, especially with, without permission. Uh, you can't assume that uh, a community is not going to pick something growing around them. Um, so uh, know where you are and what your impact is. Be aware of which plants are endangered and should you should avoid picking and which ones are invasive. And it may be helpful for the environment for you to pick as much as you can, including removing the roots while you do it. Um, there are many sources for this information, including United Plant Savers. You want to understand how the plant reproduces, so what time of year is appropriate to harvest from it in a way that will not uh, deplete the resource and allow it to replenish. So a couple examples of wild plants that have been over-harvested in, in recent decades are include ramps and ginseng, um, but you need to be aware of, of, of plants and, and their, their status. Also think about wildlife needs. So not just harvest for other people, but of course birds and other wildlife often depend on, on these uh, fruits and other parts of plants as well. So we wanna be respectful of the environment and of the work done by the stewards of, of these spaces as well. In terms of safety, again, you wanna be 100% certain about plant identification. Um, there are certain lookalikes and, and uh, specific knowledge you need to have to make sure you're safe. Uh, think about potential allergies, consumption thresholds that certain plants have, possible drug interactions for medicinal uses. Um, and again, know your proper harvest times. Uh, and in general, you know, we're trying to harvest only ripe fruit, so it won't go to waste. And we'll talk more about appropriate harvest timing in a bit. Um, Avoid contaminated soil and waterways and, and plants growing in and around them. And that this is certainly something we need to be aware of in the city. Um, in particular, thinking about uh, various types of pollution, um, contaminated lead soils, uh, runoff. Think about plants that are close to roadways where um, there may be runoff of unwanted things as well. Herbicides, pesticides may be sprayed in some areas. And think about which plants are, are safer if there's any uncertainty around this. So leafy greens, root, root crops, uh, fruits and nuts harvested from the ground are all at higher risk. Um, again, ask for permission and listen to people and plants, the environment, your gut, about when, when and how much is appropriate to harvest. Uh, practice safe food handling. Um, and then glean forage harvest at your own risk. Uh, if you're new to foraging, try to learn from others who have done this more. Uh, there's, um, you know, we mentioned a few other sources of places you can go out and and harvest with other people and, and learn the knowledge you need. And last of all, we really love to emphasize to practice gratitude 
food tastes better, you feel better if you are grateful for the, the plants and the environment and the stewards of the land that are uh, making these harvests possible for you. So next, uh, I'm going to get into talking about harvest timing, how to tell when fruits are ripe and how to pick them, which is a, a critical skill uh, to get the most out of your orchard spaces. Um, sometimes it's obvious, some some less so. But some of the ways we can tell that, that fruit is ripe is um, knowing when to expect it being ripe. So we, we have our monthly orchard task list uh, that we'll share out in um, our follow-up email, um, as well as a, a fruit harvest calendar that will be linked in that email as well. But basically letting you know what, what month of the year to expect the fruit to ripen. And of course, it varies by two to three weeks sometimes, depending on the weather and other conditions from year to year. Other things you can look at, the base color, of course. Uh, many fruits change color as they're ripening. Um, in some cases, it's important to, to note the base color, like in, with the, the drawing the uh, photo of apples here, showing the red apples gathering a sort of outer red blush over time. But ultimately, it's, it's the, the underneath tone that, that sometimes you want to look at. So uh, transitioning from green to, to more, more of a yellowish tone, regardless of the, the red blush. Um, and texture, a lot of fruit soften as they ripen. Uh, others will start to give off uh, their their delicious smell odor as they're ripening. And, and of course, taste. Uh, if you're not sure something's quite ripe, pick one and take a bite out of it uh, to before you go and harvest the whole tree. Uh, separating easily from the stem, as you see in that photo of the raspberry, um, ripe fruits are ready to come off. The, the plant at that point is trying to reproduce itself and will easily let the, the fruit go. So you'll be able to, if you're tugging at a berry, trying to get it off, it's probably not quite ripe yet. Same with many tree fruits, that those the stems will come off easily when they're, they're fully ripe. Um, tannin levels, this is a natural defense that a lot of, uh, or some fruits have, which um, discourages harvesting or eating by wildlife. Uh, a bitter um, and uh, puckering sensation if they're not fully ripe. So we think especially of persimmons for this, but certain other things like chokeberries get the name chokeberry from the tannin levels that are there before they're fully ripe or processed. And last, just to mention, bricks is a fancy word for the level of sugar in a plant. So commercial orchards will use this as a guide for finding the correct harvest time, um, either in a lab or they actually have... Uh, devices they can walk around with and see what the sugar levels are in, in their their plants before they harvest. So the one I wanted to highlight in particular are pears, because this is the one we get the most questions about and is the trickiest to know the harvest time. And this is because European pears in general don't ripen on the tree, or if they're left to ripen on the tree, they're, they're already going to be ruined or won't be of, of proper texture taste or unevenly ripened at that point. So we harvest them when they're still hard on the tree, um, but it's very important to know what type of pear you have. There's two broad categories, summer pears and winter pears. And we think of pears often as a, as a late fall fruit, because that's when often when we see them in the grocery stores or get a box in the mail or on the holidays. But many pears are, are har harvested in summer. So um, August, September is when they these summer pears ripen. And they will ripen off the tree after just a few days at room temperature storage. These include varieties like Bartlett, Harrow de Blight, Shenandoah, Colette, many others. Um, and then winter pears are picked a little later in the season, September, October, and they tend to, to last longer in storage. Um, they will ripen, you, you should keep them in cold storage until they ripen, so two to three weeks of cold storage before they ripen up. And these include Anjou, Bosque, Comis, Moonglow, Potomac, Kiefer, and others. Um, and one to know at, when you're keeping them in storage, when they're ripen, the, the, often the, the stem end is what ripens first and will start to get a little soft. Um, there are a couple varieties. Seckle is a great local variety that we love that ripens on the tree. 
Lincoln is another example of that. So there's a few exceptions to the rule. Also, Asian pears uh, are similarly a little easier to get harvest right because they ripen on the tree. Next slide. So here's our harvest calendar. And again, we'll send this out, but if you have a, a nice diverse orchard like we like to plant, you can start harvest in, in May with rhubarb and some perennial greens and even sometimes gummies will ripen that early. And all the way through November with our very late season uh, crops like persimmons, hawthorns, medlars, ginkgos, and others. So it can be a very long season of harvest. Each fruit has its own uh, storage shelf life. So how long it will last uh, before it goes bad. And this varies greatly from a few days for many of our berries to uh, many months for apples and pears kept in the right conditions. Uh, each one has its own optimal storage temperature. Varying from that temperature can shorten the shelf life. Other things to keep in mind as you're harvesting, I talked about, you know, them coming, fruits coming off easily when they're fully ripe, but gentle hands are important, especially with softer fruits. To make sure you're not damaging them as you as you harvest them. Uh, so think about that as you're you're harvesting, but also think about how you're storing them. Um, you know, soft fruits you may not want to pack into a large container and have them squash each other from the weight. So just keeping that in mind for extending the life of your what you harvest. Whole harvester, of course, is a convenient tool. Um, that may be some of us experienced going apple picking as a kid, but it's a it's a little um, little cage at the end of a, a stick that allows you to reach high into the tree to pluck fruit. And again, be, be conscious of that fruit should come off if it's fully ripe. If you're yanking at it, you may be damaging uh, not only the fruit, but the plant itself. Um, it takes a little little practice to get good at this, but it's a, it's a wonderful way to harvest a tall tree. Another tool we use is a tripod orchard ladder, which we talked about in our pruning workshop. Also use, useful for harvesting. Uh, very convenient, easy to move around, um, lightweight, and another way to get high in the tree to, to make your harvest. Then we have the shake and tarp method. Uh, this is especially useful for um, tall trees where we can't really reach to, to, to pick them, especially small fruits. We love to use this for mulberries in particular, which can get to be pretty large trees, 30, 35 feet tall. A lot of the fruit is way up in the tree. Um, we can bring out a tarp, a nice clean tarp, shake the branches, uh, and it'll drop onto the tarp. You can collect a lot in a very short time uh, from stuff you, you could just never pick from the ground or even from a ladder. Uh, it doesn't work as well for some other plants. We try, we've tried it on service berries and June berries, and you, you end up getting a lot of leaves and chaff and, and things you don't want, as well as, you know, fruit that has some cedar rust. Uh, so, you know, try it out and see what, what it works best for. Nut wizard is a, a cool little a kind of an old fashioned tool, but um, it's kind of like a wire cage on a roller. Uh, great for ground harvests. So most of our nuts that we consume drop to the ground when they're ready to, to be harvested. So there's a quick way you just roll it along and there's different sizes of mesh for different sizes of nuts. And they'll pick them up. You can see in the, the far left, they, they're also using this, a larger one for, for apples that have fallen to the ground. Um, and I haven't tried that. I'm not sure how if it's that effective for fruit, but it's clearly somebody's doing that. All right, I'm gonna hand it off to Deja. Thank you, Phil. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about a wide range of preservation methods that you can use for your harvest. For those of us that have grown before, we know that there comes a point in the season where we've basically just eaten all we've can, but our crops and our plants are just continuing to like grow and keep on giving. But um, I honestly feel like this is one of the best issues to have because when you know how to preserve an abundant harvest, you can really take those summer and fall flavors with you into the winter. And I honestly think that's when we need them the most. Um, and obviously this does 
decrease waste as well. Um, and just the reminder that, you know, our intention is not really to get into the nitty gritty of these preservation methods, but really just to give you some ideas and some inspiration as to what you can do um, with your harvest. Um, like Corey mentioned earlier in the um, earlier in the evening that we have harvest ed workshops. So those will be like a great opportunity for um, you to get more in-depth information about these techniques and get practice and take those skills home with you. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, let's get into it. So I'm going to be talking about dehydration. Um, dehydrating fruit is a really simple technique. Um, there are several ways you can dehydrate your food um, using a commercial dehydrator, a DIY solar power dehydrator, um, and you can even use your oven. So basically, um, we use a drying technique to remove moisture from fruit, and that basically makes it resistant to spoilage. Because we're not using like high heat, um, it basically retains um, basically all of the nutrient value in the fruit, which honestly makes it a very effective preservation method compared to things like canning and other preservation techniques. So when we're dehydrating, the name of the game is just to go low and slow. You don't really want to rush this process um, because if you turn the heat up, you risk sealing the outside of the fruit and then trapping the moisture inside. Um, and just in general, when you know we're processing fruits, we want to make sure that we're giving them a good wash before we process them. But especially when uh, we're engaging with the dehydrating method, you want to make sure that you're cutting your fruits evenly to make sure that they're all drying around the same time. Um, next slide, please. So I know a lot of us have probably heard like that when we do the blanching technique, a lot of times we're using vegetables, but some fruits actually will require blanching before dehydrating. And this just basically means that you're going to dip it in a pot of boiling water and let it sit for 30 seconds to a couple of minutes, um, depending on what the fruit is. And then you'll cool them down immediately in an ice bath. Um, so yeah, blanching basically helps to preserve the color and the flavor. And in this case, it really helps the moisture escape more quickly during the dehydration process. So as you can see here, um, we can see what the blanching times are for some fruits um, and if they even need to be blanched and also the ideal drying times for them. Um, and we'll be sending this um, PowerPoint afterwards so you can reference this again. So you can also um, use lemon juice to do this as well. That will also help retain color and flavor in the fruit before you dehydrate. And um, during this process, you just kind of want to make sure that you're checking the fruit. And if you're touching it and it's like sticky, that means that there's still moisture in it and you probably just want to... Um, let it dehydrate some more. Um, but basically when you're done with that process, you want to allow it to cool before storing and you wanna make sure that you're storing it in an airtight container. Um, next slide, please. So these are three different examples or these are some examples of uh, different dehydrators you can use. Um, as you can see on the top left corner, that's a commercial dehydrator. And they come in a wide range of sizes. This one is something that you could probably set on your countertop. Um, and they have some that, some that are as big as like small refrigerators. And those are typically used in like commercial kitchens. Um, but yeah, there's a wide range of dehydrators depending on the quantity of things that you're going to be dehydrating. Um, but it is a very simple and low maintenance uh appliance to use. You just plug it in, slice your fruit up, put them on the racks, and then most of the dehydrators have like um, a time and a temperature setting so you can adjust it to your desired settings. And you can like leave for the day and come back and check on it and uh, let it do its thing and come back to dehydrated fruit. So very low maintenance, very easy. Um, we see a solar dehydrator to the right. And that basically collects um, energy from the sun to heat up air, which uh, dehydrates the fruit. Um, it's typically like an enclosed, um, it's typically enclosed so your food isn't exposed to like outside or direct sunlight, but 
it's definitely a great DIY project. And then um, the last thing you can do is you can use your oven. So basically with this, you definitely want to, this is like a good project for if you're like, at home and you kind of want to have like a kitchen project that you can monitor throughout the day. Um, you basically want to set your oven on like the lowest setting somewhere in between 140 and 170 degrees. And you want to crack the door on your oven so that the moisture has somewhere to escape. And ideally, if you're doing this, it would be great to have a fan that's blowing into the oven um, because that's going to help circulate most of the moist air out and then replace it with drier air, which helps with the dehydration process. Um, next slide, please. And yeah, so like I feel like we've maybe all heard of fruit leather before. It's definitely like a great snack and it's a very easy process. Um, all you have to do is puree the fruit that you're using, spread it thin, and then dehydrate it. And then when it's done, you just cut it into pieces and roll it up. So definitely like so many little snacks that you can make from um, using a dehydrator. Next slide, please. And yeah, so basically if you don't have time and you have a huge harvest and you just want to make sure that you can save it, you can just bag it up, label the bags, and put them in the freezer. Um, it's a very simple, not time-consuming process. So, yeah, I'm going to pass it back to Phil. Great. Um, yeah, I'm going to sort of uh, breeze through various other, hopefully, inspirational ideas of what you can do with harvests. Uh, we're not going to try to explain how to do all these. Again, our Pop Harvest Ed series will give more hands-up op opportunities to learn these things. But uh, many ways to preserve these flavors into other seasons, um, these are all very similar. Uh, basically putting fruit together with sugar, which is the main preservative in this case, and if the fruit, you have to know whether your fruit is low in pectin. You may need to add pectin. Some fruits already have plenty. And some fruits are low in acid and may also benefit from the addition of some, some lemon juice uh, to prolong the, the preservation. But uh, properly done, you know, you can keep these in your cupboard for, for years um, and save those wonderful flavors. So these are actually four jams that I made last year from pop fruits and fruits from my yard. Um, but I, I really love to, to to do all these things. But jellies, jams, preserves, fruit butters, marmalades, con conserves are all similar, uh, slightly different textures and techniques that do the same thing. Next slide. Fruit-based sauces and syrups, very similar, maybe slightly different in how they're used. It might be used, uh, you know, as part of a, a barbecue sauce or something for, for cooking something or uh, a topping for ice cream, something along those lines. But basically a, a thinner textured version of uh, a jelly, more or less. Food mill, really useful tool to have around the kitchen um, when you're doing this kind of work. And it basically is a, a strainer and masher at the same time, and really a wonderful thing to have um, low tech way to separate the parts you want to use from the seeds and the skin and, and things like that. So commonly used for making applesauce, you don't have to, to core and separate every part of the apple, just put them through the food mill, just crank hand cranks to do this. In this case, I'm, I'm uh, Working on some some gummies, which have kind of large seeds, but separating the, the flesh from those. Um, this was turned into that fruit leather you, you saw on the, the earlier slide. And of course, baked goods. One of the first things we think of when we think of fruit is making pies. All kinds of wonderful combinations. Of course, there's many other baked goods um, like muffins and, and breads and other things you can do. A wonderful way you don't have to use fresh fruit free, frozen fruit works well for for many baked goods too another useful tool we have for processing harvest uh very popular at our fall festivals uh of the cider press we have a couple of these that uh, hand cranked versions uh, you can get 
um, electric versions as well, but this is a, always a lot of fun for everyone. So a way to, to squeeze down and, and get the juice from, from apples or other fruit. Um, grape press, very similar uh, for grapes and smaller fruits. And yeah, we can make all kinds of wonderful beverages out of our fruits. Cider, of course, we usually think apples, but um, many other fruits can be incorporated into them. Um, uh, pear cider is called perry. We've also had some wonderful peach ciders locally made. Uh, wines, we usually think of grapes, of course, but they can be made from many other fruits too. Um, uh, cherries and various berries and things like that even some non-fruits like several folks have mentioned uh looking forward to making some dandy dandelion wine this year um beer of course not usually made with fruit but uh that you will see in i feel like an increasing number of micro brews with various fruits uh included in the brew mead is a honey-based um beverage also often with incorporating fruit and then kombucha, of course, a non-alcoholic brewed beverage, uh, often with fruit as well. So a lot of different options for, for beverages. Pickles and ferments, generally done with vegetables. Um, and, you know, certainly we grow some, some perennial vegetables in orchards as well. Uh, but uh, one, one thing to be aware of, sometimes we do pickle fruits like the strawberries you see here, they tend to have a much shorter shelf life because you don't really want uh, a lot of sugar um, in with the ferment. It, it, um, it can be done, but it just won't last as long. Um, but one thing that we, we've had some workshop, workshops on, including last spring, was uh, a, a uh, fermented green plum workshop, so making pickled plums. And so in the late late spring, that's when we're thinning the fruit on our trees. Um, and there are traditional recipes from various cultures for turning those unripe fruits in, into a pickled, uh, delicious pickled food. So we've done that with plums. Um, I've also seen recipes for, for green peaches picked in late spring too. And just briefly, um, a fermentation crop can be a useful thing for some of these processes. And we have some time for questions and, and answers. Um, Erica, did we get any questions in the chat? Or does, with a small group, we also welcome people to turn on their mic and, and pose a question. Yeah, I haven't seen anybody share anything directly in the chat. But yeah, at this point, anybody can either open up in the chat or just turn on their speaker and share. It doesn't have to be a question. If you have a, a technique you love to use and want to share, we welcome that as well. I think we, we can move on if no one has anything to add. All right, so I am gonna take it from here. So we've learned about all these different processes that we can do for preserving food and using fruit, but what are some easy to grow alternatives to common fruits? Um, common fruits such as apples and peaches are two of the most challenging fruits to grow in our humid climate here in Philly. And they are prone to a lot of pest and disease issues. Um, fruits like bananas may not provide any yield in our climate, um, unless you're growing them in a greenhouse. So what can we grow as an alternative? We're gonna talk about it. So first we have one of my favorites. It's the Asian pear, which a lot of you um, in the poll said that you've already tried before. Um, this is a really great fruit tree alternative if you're interested in growing apples, because apples are gonna require a much more intensive spray routine um, for pest management, for disease management. Um, Asian pears are just as crunchy and just as juicy as an apple. The only difference is that you're going to have a bit of a mild pear flavor. Um, another benefit to growing Asian pears is that unlike the European pear, it ripens right on the tree. So between August and September, you don't have to consider the ripening time um, um, as previous 
as previously discussed in some of the, the older slides there, you can just pluck it right off the tree. Um, Asian pears are high in fiber, vitamin K, and can be eaten fresh in a cider or in baked goods. Um, generally, we see way fewer pest and disease issues and you're usually gonna get a really consistent prolific production with Asian pears. Next slide. Crab apples. So we define a crab apple as any apple that is smaller than two inches. Um, you may see crab apple trees commonly planted as street trees or as ornamental trees with really small fruits. So if you are interested in walking around your neighborhood to um, pick some crab apples, make sure you're looking for larger fruited trees. Um, crab apple trees are great pollinator trees um, because they have a long bloom time. So that's about 10 days. Uh, crab apples are high in fiber, antioxidants and flavonoids and can aid in digestion. Um, as far as flavor, if you've never had a crab apple before, they're quite, quite tart, um, sometimes even a bit sour. Um, they're great in jellies, in chutneys, in apple butters, and in cider with regular apples or on their own. They give it kind of like a nice tart kind of sour flavor. Um, some varieties of crab apples have been historically valued for their fruit rather than um, their ornamental value. Jujube. So this is the fruit that um, everyone was saying they're not as familiar with. Um, so this is a really easy to grow fruit with a sweet, mildly tart apple flavor, depending on when you harvest it. Um, they have virtually no pest or disease issues. Um, if you harvest them around August, September, while they're still kind of greenish yellow. So if you look at that top right hand corner picture, you're seeing some of those green yellow fruits. If you harvest them then, they will have the flavor and sort of the texture and crispiness of an apple. But if you wait a little longer around late September, October, um, and you pick them when they have this reddish brown color, they're going to taste and feel similar to having a date. Um, this is why another name for the jujube is the Chinese date. Uh, jujubes are high in vitamin A, C, fiber, and antioxidants, and their dried leaves and root bark have traditionally been used for a variety of purposes, um, specifically in Chinese um, uh, traditional medicine um, for gastrointestinal issues, to treating wounds, to insomnia, um, a wide variety of um, ailments. Continue. So now we're gonna take a look at some alternatives to stone fruit. And these are not like true alternatives, but um, these are close enough that they're, you know, close alternatives that are just as delicious and grow really well in our climate. So first we have the persimmon. Um, we have to just say that this is the easiest fruit tree to grow out of all the fruit trees that pop um, plants in our orchards. They have no pest and disease issues. They're self-fertile. Um, they're not cold sensitive and they produce year after year. So this is a really great tree for anyone who wants to play, like plant a tree and basically leave it alone. Um, something to note with persimmons is that all American varieties and some Asian varieties of persimmons are incredibly astringent until they're fully ripe. So you want to wait until they're dead ripe um, before you harvest it or else when you bite into it, it's going to be really, really astringent. It's gonna be really, really uncomfortable. Um, persimmons are, oh, I also need to mention with persimmons that if you don't wanna wait, you can get the Fuyu variety, which can be eaten when firm. Um, persimmons are really high in vitamin C and beta carotene. Um, they have a sweet, mild, rich flavor. And if you've ever had a persimmon or if you've never had one before, an almost kind of like gooey consistency, it's really delicious. Um, they're really fantastic fresh. You can also have them in a jam, um, in a smoothie, as fruit leather. They make really great fruit leather. And, um, I've often had them in baked goods like persimmon bread. Um, as Corey had mentioned before, there's a Japanese Japanese method of um, drying persimmons called hoshigaki. So basically you skin the persimmon, 
you uh, tie a string around it and you just have it dry out. Um, another alternative or another thing you can do with persimmons is that you can freeze them to remove the astringency or you can soak them in vinegar um, to remove it. And then as a result, you can also have persimmon flavored vinegar that you can use as dressing, as a marinade with seafood, um, pretty much any way that you would use any sort of like vinegar based dressing, you can use it. Eight. Next slide, please. And here we have the fig, um, which I know, I'm sure, actually, that most people here are pretty com um, familiar with. But this um, fruit has a main crop that ripens August through October. Um, and when the fruit is ripe, something to note is that you can pick it when it's soft and when it kind of pretty much just like bends right off at the tip. You don't want to depend on the color to tell the ripeness for figs because they can be green and still ready to pick depending on your um, the variety. Um, also something to keep in mind is that if we have a mild winter, we have something with figs called a braba crop. So this is when the fruit buds over winter and then produce um, fruit that ripens around July before the main, ripe, um, before the main crop that ripens in August. Um, figs have the highest mineral content of any fruit that we plant. Um, and it includes calcium, iron, copper, potassium, and magnesium. Um, they're perfect for jams. Phil makes a really great fig jams. Um, and they can also be eaten, of course, fresh and dried. And unripe figs can also be preserved in syrup or pickled. And next we have another favorite of mine. It is the pawpaw. So this is a really great alternative if you're someone who's interested in growing more tropical light fruit or even something like a banana. This is called the banana of the north. Um, it's the northerly cousin of the soursop and the custard apple. Um, it has a banana-like kind of custard-like texture when you um, open it up um, and it is super high in protein. Um, it is native to North America. And we always like to say three quarters of people who try a papa absolutely love it. And another quarter absolutely hate it. They think it's the worst thing ever. Um, so everyone is different. Um, but if you've never had it before, we do recommend that you try it very sparingly um, because for some people they have reported having some stomach irritation. So just try a little bit. Um, they're just very nutrient rich. Um, for every 100 grams, you get 10% of your daily value of potassium, 39% um, of your iron and 130% of your manganese, 25% of your copper. Um, and the thing to note with pawpaws is that once you harvest them, they have quite a short shelf life. Um, so you can freeze them for breads or for puddings or for ice cream. Um, if you do decide you want to plant a pawpaw, something to keep in mind is that you need to make sure you get two for pollination. So now we're going to get into a couple of fruits that are um, alternatives to blueberries and cherries and anything with a sort of like ant rich antioxidants um, and kind of that like nice acidic like flavor profile. So here we have one of my favorites. This is me pictured here. It's the Nanking cherry. I'm always talking about this fruit. I was literally talking about it today because the Nankings at the Learning Orchard are starting to bloom. So this is a fast growing full sun shrub. It is actually a true cherry. The only difference is that it's a bush cherry. Um, the great thing about this is that it has fewer pests and disease issues than you'd get with a cherry tree. Um, it is East Asian in origin. Um, and if you want a Nanking cherry, you need to get two for pollination, but I cannot stress enough that they're really easy to grow. Um, because of their dense bloom, as pictured on the top right-hand corner, they have great ornamental value, but even more than that, you're gonna get a really prolific yield. Um, as far as the flavor, they're a little more tart than like a sweet cherry, but they're still quite sweet. Um, you can harvest them in midsummer. Uh, Nanking cherries are high in vitamin A, C, and iron. Uh, you can eat them fresh or you can cook it in water to burst the skin. 
um, that will separate the pits and you can make parts and jellies or sauces. And here we have another favorite. Um, this is the Gumi Berry. So this is a pop favorite um, since it's a nitrogen fixing plant. So it helps improve the soil of the surrounding plants. Um, it usually bears its first fruit in May um, or even June. Um, it's shade tolerant and really, really easy to grow. Uh, the fruit is small and cherry-like with a slight, slight like tart, sometimes even astringent flavor. Um, it has a, it's really, really fantastic for jelly and it is high in vitamins A, C, and E. And then we have the June berry. Um, so this is also known as the service berry. It's a um, plant or it's a tree that is native to Pennsylvania. And it is commonly planted throughout the city as street and park trees. They are very interesting um, flavor wise because they're like a blueberry, um, but they have a bit of a cherry, like a slight cherry flavor and then little edible seeds that have an almond flavor. So you're getting like a full kind of um, fruit experience with this. They are high in anthocyanins, which is a type of antioxidant. Um, and they're historically, they have been, um, they were used by indigenous people to create something called pemmican, which is this like nutrient dense cake um, that had um, animal fat and dried um, meat and berries. Um, June berries, can be used fresh or in jellies and ice cream and kombucha and baked goods. And Pop even has a whole um, time of the year dedicated to the Juneberry. It's called Juneberry Joy. And this is when you can come with Pop staff. We walk around and we pick Juneberries and we learn more in depth about this native fruit. All right, so I'm gonna pass it on over to Erica who's gonna talk more about some low na maintenance uh, native plant alternatives. Cool, thanks Sharon. Um, I also noticed that there are a few questions in the chat, so maybe we'll pause here and just take a look at those. The first one is, uh, how did you all get into this work? I don't know if we all wanna share, just a few of us, um, but that's such an excellent question because I'm always curious about people, how people end up in urban ag and orchard specifically. Um, and the next question we have is, what are your biggest challenges with fruit trees? Any challenges with harvesting? Um, I can start by sharing that I got into the work because I lived really close to the woodlands, the learning orchard at the woodlands, and I would walk by the site and I felt really curious about it. I started getting really interested in urban agriculture and I actually got connected to Sharon, who had me start as a lead orchard volunteer at the woodlands. So. For me, it was mostly about proximity and my interest in like getting my hands in the soil and being outside. Um, and from that point, I just started learning a lot more. And biggest challenges with fruit trees, there's a few, um, you know, with the climate changing, we're experiencing a lot of different pest and disease issues um, that we have to respond to every year. There's kind of like a new, I don't know, a, a new character in the mix that we have to respond to um, with more moisture in the air and more warmth. It brings just a whole set of issues. And when we're not using chemical pesticides, we have to kind of do a lot of different DIY approaches. That's one challenge and other folks can share some other ones, but challenges with harvesting, just cause I'm fresh off of pruning season, something that I can think of is like, if a tree is too tall, we're not gonna be able to reach it during harvest season, right? Like our ladders can only go so tall. So something we do during pruning season is to actually prune the tree to a certain height. That's actually, so it's such that we're able to harvest the fruit during harvest season. Um, so, you know, if a fruit tr tree is growing too tall, then birds or other squirrels will actually just end up eating all that fruit. So that's one challenge I could think of. I don't know, Deja, Ricardo, Sharon, do either of you want to share? Um, I guess to the, I want to see who it was because they're so, um, Ivana asking how I got into this work. I um, volunteered a lot in urban ag when I moved to Philly in 2018 um, and then started with POP in 2021. Um, but if you're curious about working more in like 
orcharding or with fruit trees or edible perennials, um, we do have a lead orchard volunteer program where um, you become basically an ongoing volunteer to a site, a pop orchard partnered site, and then you get to you get resources um, and work hands on. So just let us know um, if you are interested and we can like send over some information after. Um, yeah, I'm happy to share about how I got involved. Um, one of the board members who actually does a lot of like mutual aid food work in West Philly, um, uh, her name is Gina. She actually shared, um, uh, one of the pop postings and I was already kind of familiar, um, with their work, but, um, Anyway, like I just have always, I think, yeah, like in 2020, I was like, I want to learn how to grow my own food. And I also met Sharon at Mill Creek. And so it was kind of like full circle when I joined POP. But um, I think I was like really excited to join an organization that was like focused on like teaching people how to grow their own food and like making food more accessible across the city. So um yeah, it just felt really aligned. And I feel like a lot of people that I knew and respected were also like already involved with pop. So yeah, it was kind of a a sweet opportunity. Um, I noticed a new question. Um, someone asked, I wanna see who it was. Um, Catalina asks, curious if this, these preferred fruits have changed over time for our growing zone. Um, mm -hmm. Phil or Corey, y'all have been doing like orcharding work a little longer. Is, do you have any observations? Sure. Um, yeah, we've been, we're in our 16th year now and definitely the sort of plant palette that we recommend has changed over time, basically on based on our experience of what has worked well and what, what hasn't. So in the early years, we planted a lot more of the common fruits, apples and stone fruits, and quickly began to realize that they are very hard to grow without a lot of intensive management. And so we've really moved pretty heavily towards recommending a lot of these uncommon fruits that we've just highlighted in this last section as alternatives that are going to be much more productive with a lot less challenges and need for spraying and things like that. Um, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, definitely. It's always evolving. We're always trying new things as well. Um, we may have to add pomegranates to this presentation next year, which is something new we've been growing. That's actually been working pretty well and been easy to grow. Um, so yeah, always, always trying new things and it's always evolving. And certainly as climate change continues, uh, we'll be exploring yet more plants and probably we'll have other things that we're working and maybe not won't work in the future. But um, yeah, just I guess since I'm talking, I'll briefly share like um, how I got involved. Um, I have a background in horticulture and landscape design, uh, but I was really, you know, that that industry primarily serves the wealthy, those that can afford to pay for those services. And I, I really never was comfortable with that idea. I wanted to apply my knowledge to benefit a broader community. So got involved with urban farming and really with a goal that everyone should be able to to grow some of their own food and, and sharing that knowledge as widely as possible. Um, so I've been doing this 20 years now. Uh, and yeah, anybody else want to share along those lines? Did we get, I thought we got maybe one more question in too. We did, yeah. The next question that we had was, are you cutting apical buds to prevent trees getting too tall? Does that also encourage fruit bearing lateral limbs? Um, happy to answer that one too. Uh, yeah, we, we do remove apical bed buds as part of what we call a heading cut. It's not generally what's used to control the height of the tree. Um, we we'll, we'll do more thinning cuts for that purpose. But it is certainly something we use to en encourage the forming of more fruiting buds. Um, but yeah, you can check that out in our pop core. One presentation on pruning is 
is on our YouTube, as well as if you want to hear about the challenges of fruit growing, Popcorn 2 on pest and disease, that's really been our, you know, as mentioned, primary growing and harvesting challenges are those pest and disease issues. Definitely. Thanks, Phil. Um, I guess maybe I'll get started with the citrus, but if other pop staff, well, are there any other pop staff who would like to share or, or other participants who would like to share how they got involved? We could also, while I'm talking about citrus, folks can share in the chat a little blurb about how they got into their area of work. I don't know if there's a preference there, but okay. Yeah, I'll get started um, talking about another alternative to um, fruit growing that we can do actually here in the Philly area, and that is citrus. Um, so most citrus are not actually viable in this climate, but we're in the process of, you know, we're in a slow process, we'll say, of building a high tunnel to experiment with some zone eight crops. These are some hardier crops such as kumquat or yuzu that we could actually grow in this region, especially in a high tunnel. But in the meantime, um, since we have, haven't actually been able to start building our high tunnel yet, we have, there are a few things that you can actually grow outside. Um, Next slide, please. The f oh wait, yeah. The first that we have is sorrel. So sorrel is kind of an alternative because the flavor palette is similar to that of lemon. So sorrel is a perennial green that comes back year after year and has a really um, delicious lemony flavor. And it can be used in soups or salads or even as just like an herb alternative. It's really easy to grow and it's just a really... If it, for that reason, because it's delicious and easy to grow, it's a really great addition to a really to having a diverse food forest. Um, the sour flavor from in sorrel is due to the presence of oxalic acid. So we've worked with different school groups, and this is one of our favorite um, crops to show young kids because we'll have them taste it, and some kids will call it lemon let lemon lettuce because it's just a really fun, exciting. You know, you expect to taste something like lettuce or you expect to taste something like spinach and these kids will find that it actually tastes like lemon so it's kind of just like a surprising taste uh it does have a medicinal value but you also do want to be careful with using too much or eating too much sorrel especially if you're prone to kidney stones because it can lock up calcium in your body uh, we added a little recipe here, which is kind of like a citrus herb dressing where you use sorrel instead of lemon. Like yesterday, I made, a, um, you know, I made a really easy salad dressing, but I used lemon juice. And in the summertime, hopefully I'll be able to be able to use sorrel instead. Um, it's just like to replace that lemony flavor that you might find. Uh, the other crop that we can actually grow in this region is called the trifoliate orange. Um, it is, it has been grown in the Philly region since the colonial era. And this is because it's a hardy form of citrus and it's one of the only deciduous citrus varieties, which is why it can survive here in the winter because it drops its leaves. It's a really cool plant. Um, and for most years, Pop has done a workshop using trifoliate oranges, picked up some of the historic sites where we can show off some of its purposes. Uh, something to note about the trifoliate orange is that they're extremely sour. Um, they have a pretty thick rind and they have a lot of seeds inside of them. So this is not a fruit that you're just going to harvest and eat right from the tree. Uh, it also has really intense thorns. So that's just like something to be aware of as you're harvesting. Uh, it can be used to make a lot of different things though, which is cool. As long as you kind of go through a certain process, you can make a trifoliate orange lemonade. If you add enough sugar and process it, um, you can add it into a tea. Some people have made marmalade from the rinds and, uh, the last thing that you can use with a uh, trifoliate orange, if you process it in this certain way that we added in this slide is by combining it with two parts of vinegar and some using some of the juice as well as the peels, you can create a cleaning agent. So, you know, it's like, it's sort of like a natural citrusy cleaning agent that you can make using those, that, that crop. Yeah. And I'll pass it on to the next person. 
So I'm going to go through this section um, fairly quickly in the interest of time. We've got a few more sections after this. But, um, you know, we often think about sweet fruits coming out of our orchards, but we can also grow and harvest proteins from them, especially thinking about nuts, but also uh, acorns, mushrooms. Um, and we're going to start off with Hardy almonds, which is uh, a cool discovery we made a few years back. Um, true almonds always just bloom too early here. So they get hit by a, a frost and rarely, if ever, get a crop. But we discovered that there are peach almond crosses. Uh, they're very closely related. You can cross the pollen from one with another and get a hybrid that um, it, in these particular varieties will um, have the production of an almond, but the late blooming of a peach. And they've done pretty well for us. Uh, they do get some of the challenges that other stone fruits get, in, in particular oriental fruit moth has proved to be a challenge for hardy almonds, which can ruin a, a fair amount of the crop each year if unmanaged. Um, you can harvest almonds at various stages, including green almonds in the sp late spring uh, when, before they've formed a hard seed, and you can actually eat the whole thing, including the sort of fruity outer part. Um, but uh, typically harvested in in late summer into fall after they've split open and uh, harvested like like um, at that point and eaten like a traditional almond nut. Um, next slide. Chestnuts have uh, been our most successful nut harvests. Many nut trees get very large. So hardy almonds, actually, that's the other reason we like hardy almonds is they're a fairly small tree, 15 to 20 feet. Uh, chestnuts can get a bit bigger, but not as big as some of the other options. Um, they are the most squirrel resistant of nuts. So very hard to get good nut crops uh, with uh, the squirrel pressure we have in the city. Um, they can be a challenge for fruits as well, but nuts in particular. But chestnuts, as you can see, have spiky balls around the, the nuts that protect them from squirrels and other predation. Um, and the American chestnut is... Uh, was lost to, to a disease blight in the last century. Uh, so we've been planting Chinese chestnuts as well as hybrid Chinese-American uh, chestnuts, and they've done pretty well. Um, and they are harvested in September, October. Generally, they will drop to the ground as much as most nuts do and split open, and you need to pick them pretty quickly at that point uh, before the squirrels get to them. Um, but uh, yeah, they've done pretty well. Uh, in the sites we planted to them. Next slide. Hazelnuts, another option for a smaller um, nut tree, uh, the, really more of a shrub that will get uh, usually about 15 feet high at most. So manageable size and they are pretty prolific producers, but we've seen a lot of challenges with squirrels. We have one site at Hassel High School that has uh, rows of these, but in a more open field, which is, um, with the larger trees at some distance and and have not had have had good harvests there because they're more protected that way from squirrels. Um, but again, you know, full of full of nutrition uh, and protein. Um, and um, yeah, uh, let's go to the next slide. Ginkgo nuts, another one we love to highlight uh, with our pop harvest program. Each year um, we have a ginkgo nut roast at one of our partner sites, Grumblethorpe, that happens to have the oldest female ginkgo tree in, in North America. Um, and, uh, you know, you're probably familiar with these trees. They're actually planted all over the city, including as street trees, uh, beautiful trees, um, but uh, mostly people are planting male trees that don't produce fruit because the females, of course, are stinky. The fruit is very, very smelly. Um, but there are plenty of older park sites that do have some female trees. And inside that terribly stinky fruit is actually a super tasty seed. Um, so, you know, early to, to late fall, they'll drop from the tree. Uh, you smell that horrible smell, come back with some gloves, gather the, these fruits, put them into water, rub off the fleshy outside, and you're left with these seeds, which then can be roasted and kind of taste like a, a cheesy peanut is how I would describe them. But they're, they're, they're quite tasty. 
abundant in the city. Um, you do need to be cautious, um, generally not eating more than 10 at a time to avoid stomach issues, um, but they are tasty in small quantities. Acorns, another, this was, uh, of course, from oak trees and were a staple of the indigenous diet for many groups uh, throughout North America. Uh, commonly made into acorn flour is the way to consume them. They only produce every few years. They're called a, a, a mast, which is, means they, they skip years in order to being them not to get all consumed by squirrels. They wait a few years and then have a super abundant crop. But in those years, they're, they're, they'll are they drop tons and tons of acorns that can be gathered um, and turned into flour. You do need to be aware they most acorns have a high level of tannins that need to be leached out, usually, usually using multiple changes of water. Um, but this is a, a potentially abundant protein resource in the city. And last, just want to men mention mushrooms, um, high in protein and many other nutrients. Uh, the one wanted to highlight, we will be holding some mushroom growing workshops this year, um, but uh, Stropharia is the one we like to highlight because it, it fits so well with orchard spaces. In that it's in unlike other mushrooms that grow on logs, this one will grow in mulch, which we're often already mulching our gardens, our orchards, and you can seed those that mulch um, with mycelium uh, that will spread and and later on produce wonderful mushrooms. They're also called wine caps or garden giants. Uh, they're very hard to to confuse with other mushrooms if you know their characteristics. They have a secondary ring underneath their main cap that makes them pretty easy to distinguish. Um, but anyway, basically you can get a bonus harvest of, of protein, uh, mushroom, protein rich mushrooms from your orchard space by seeding them with stropharia. And I'll pass it on to Carol. Hello, I'm gonna talk very briefly about our herbal allies and some plant medicine that we can make from plants we commonly see in the orchards. Uh, before I start, I just want to remind what Phil had said in the beginning, which is to not consume um, any plants that you're not familiar with and to always consult with a medical professional, especially if you are on medication or taking things daily for your health. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So um, a big thing that we have realized is many of the herbs in our orchards are uh, underutilized and they have a lot of medicinal properties but can also be really tasty additions to our food. Um, there's a couple different ways to dry herbs um, and use them for later. So herbs are best dried out of the sunlight with good air circulation. Often you can just tie them um, from their stems and let them hang. Another way is to lay out a bed sheet and have a fan blowing over them. And one of my favorite ways to dry herbs is to put them on the dashboard of a car and just leave um, a window cracked. That way they can dry really quickly, especially in the summer. Um, an important part about drying herbs is also preserving them in a way that can keep their flavor and their um, tasty smells. So it's great to put them in a glass jar and um, leave the lid on. The only thing with that is just make sure that your herb is fully dried. Um, to do that, I'm often just taking a leaf, putting it in the palm of my hand and making sure that it is all crunchy. That way um, there is not a possibility of it going bad once you put that lid on top. And we can go to the next slide. Another way to use um, our herbs, both fresh and dried, is in infusions and decoctions, which is just another way of saying tea preparations. For an infusion at the top, you can see just some mint leaves in some boiling water. Um, when you're using fresh herbs, you're going to use half the amount that you would a dried herb because a dry herb is going to be um, more medicinal and stronger than your fresh herb. So usually you want to use one to two tablespoons of dried herbs per quart of water and then four to five um, of fresh material. And then for a decoction, this is usually for your roots, barks, or nuts. And for that, you basically just have um, the plant in water simmering for about 20 minutes and then you can steep it and let steep it for another hour 
and then it'll be prepared and that photo of the little pot is kind of like what you want your decoction to look like and those will keep both the infusion and the de decoction up to three days in the refrigerator. Go to the next slide. Another way of preserving the plant medicine is in a tincture. Most commonly, this is done with high proof alcohol. Um, and you can use chopped fresh or dried herbs. Sometimes folks put this in a blender with their menstruum. Um, and then you will basically let this sit away from the sunlight uh, shaking it every day to make sure that it is um, the menstruum is extracting the um, the plant medicine besides alcohol you can also use vinegar and glycerin the only thing with those two methods is that you want to make sure that you are using a, a dried plant material instead of the fresh so that it does not rot um, so yeah keep that in a cool dark place six to eight weeks and then you will strain it um, and you can have it in small jars and dose it as as you see necessary another way of preserving and using herbs is for topical use so that means use on your skin and um, there's a lot of different cosmetic ways that this can be done for this you're going to be using dried material only because the oil has water in it and it will rot if you mix dried herbs um, with the oil. So here you can also use the blender method. And for this, you can actually let the extraction happen in the sun. There's a lot of different methods of using oil um, in the sun ex extract for extracting it. Um, and you also want to make sure that you're shaking this every day once you mix it. There are ways that you can do this um, using a crock pot, but you have to make sure it's on the absolute lowest setting possible because you don't ever want your oil to boil over. Um, and a great thing about having an infused herbal oil is that you can also make salves and um, yeah, make sure that y'all are staying in touch with us because we will have more workshops on making um, some salves and some tinctures later in the year. So I'm going to talk quickly about some of the plants that we see. First, we have Echinacea, which also is known as purple coneflower. Um, this is a highly, highly medicinal plant, which is actually endangered in the United States. So please never harvest it if you see it in the wild. It's often cultivated as an ornamental plant and it is a pollinator. So again, being careful with how you are harvesting it. Um, and it's been used for thousands of years and originally by the quinoa and Chennai people for coughs and um, problems with the throat. And then the Pawnee people used it for headaches. So uh, the strongest way to prepare this medicine would be in a tincture using the roots, the leaves and the flower. Um, and uh, it can also be used as a tea. You wanna make sure that you are harvesting it in the fall. Another one of our plants that we have in a lot of our orchards is the elderberry. Um, it has these beautiful white flowers, which then turn into these um, dark purple berries. Both are medicinal. This is most commonly seen in your elderberry syrup, which um, children like. Everybody likes elderberry syrup. And we do have a recipe for this on our resource page of our website. Um, yeah, that's what I'll say about elderberry. You can go to the next slide. Another great herb is peppermint, great as a cold tea or a hot tea, great for digestion, um, really helps cool the body down. The only thing that you wanna be careful if you have heartburn because it can increase um, heartburn in your body and you can use all aerial parts of this plant. It's super easy to dry, can also be used as a tea or as a tincture. And then we have fennel, um, which is really delicious, has been used for hundreds of years in cooking. The seeds are really great for digestive issues um, and it stimulates milk flow for pregnant people. And uh, yeah, you'll see this, the seeds are usually come out in the fall and they're just really delicious to chew. It can also be made into a tincture. And lastly, but not least, we have yarrow, which pops up all around the city. It's an antiseptic, so it stops bleeding and um, the flowers can be used to treat fever. The medicine in the plant um, helps, like I was saying with the 
making herbal oils. It can be used for a lot of different medicines that are applied to the skin, and you can take it internally. It tastes great with peppermint and uh, use it as needed. It's not intended for long-term use. And now Corey is going to talk about volunteer plants to close this out. Thanks, Kato. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about some volunteer plants to finish up, uh, the wild edibles. And I'm also going to reference back real quick to what Phil said at the beginning. We want to think about, do we have permission uh, to harvest these things? Is there soil contamination? Are people spraying herbicides, pesticides? Um, be selective. Um, and the orchard and the plants that we selected for this presentation are often found in our orchards. As Phil said, you know that that's not like a welcome in. Come harvest these from our orchards, but that they're often found in cultivated spaces. So, um, not too hard to find. So first, dandelions for your dandelion wine, um, starting to come up. And what I like to think about is like, um, what foraging for wild edibles helps me feel like in touch with what's happening in the environment around me, right? Like it's spring and the spring is putting through, forth all these like dark green leaves that happen to be really good for stimulating digestion and aiding and cleaning your liver. Um, and so, uh, so now is a good time to get up these dark green leaves, the nettles, the dandelions. Um, they're a great source of vitamin C. Uh, and you can put them in your pesto. That's a good way to pack a punch. You get a lot of them in at once. You can also eat their flowers um, or their roots are especially antiviral and probiotic. Eating them in stir fries are actually pretty tasty and teas, uh, kind of like a coffee replacement almost drink. And then garlic mustard is an invasive and you should harvest it by the roots. Um, it was brought here by colonizers to treat scurvy, parasitic worms, and gangrene. Um, we don't really need it for those reasons anymore, but uh, it being high in vitamin A and C is great for us. So uh, it, by its name, you can tell it has a strong garlic taste and it can be used as a garlic substitute. Maybe in your pesto with your dandelion greens. Um, yeah, it's really hard to get rid of because it has thousands of seeds per plant and it's what they call alleliopathic. And so it suppresses growth from any other plant around it. So you get these huge growths of it in the woods like you see in that lower picture. Red clover uh, is also coming up in the spring near you. Nutritious, rich in calcium, iron, and nitrogen. Um, it helps... It helps to detoxify the blood, which is the next step after detoxifying your liver, cleansing your liver. Um, a lot of times when you detox, it comes out in skin problems, uh, eczema, psoriasis, and uh, red clover can help to soothe that along with soothing deep persistent coughs um, and helping folks alleviate menstrual menopausal symptoms. So a good way to identify that it's red that red clover is what you're seeing and not a different type of clover is the chevron. It's this light green V and the darker green leaf. Um, I used to think that all of the clover were the same, but if you look closely, you will see that it's not the case. And it's a it's a really nice tasting sweet tea. Um, and then plantain. This is one that I always look for because I'm always getting stung by bees and wasps. And uh, it draws the toxins out of the butt, blood body and it reduces inflammation. And it also gives me something to do, something to focus on when I'm so much in pain. Um, so you can make a spit pulse out of it. When I am stung, I find it, I chew it up um, to kind of get it activated. And then I, I bandage it onto my arm so that it'll stay there. And that is our big long talk Thanks for sticking with us. If you have any questions, we'd love, we, we're happy to stay on and talk for a little longer. And please join us in two weeks for Orchard and Food Forest Design Workshop. And what a nice team to work with. Thank you so much, team. You're wonderful.
You made a great presentation. I'm happy to work with you. I'll see you again tomorrow. <laughs> Samantha's going to come back in two weeks. Great. And I'll be sending out an email in the next couple of days with a survey. We'd love to hear how we can make this better for you. Obviously, we're earnest. We're enthusiastic. We're all here to support your learning. Um, so if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. All right. Have a great night, everybody. <laughs> Bye.